Good morning, church. Arise. Let's praise the Lord. joining us online we're glad that you are here uh, if you want to you can check in if you are new to us fill out a connection card that's found in uh, the pew backs or you can check in on Facebook so other folks know where you are this morning uh, let's begin first with our litany that you'll find up on the screen we gather as a community of faith in God's abundant world To remember that love will always be more powerful than death. We gather as people of faith in the light of God's world. Welcome to worship. Walk in the light. Amen and amen. And we'll continue in song. Spoke it to me. You are the King of Kings. Yes. 
services. It is about responding to the world and telling the world how we are choosing to live. It's our statement of faith. Will you join me as you find it up on the screen? We believe that the way we treat one another is the fullest expression of how we live out our faith. We find our approach to God through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, who is our model for living. And we recognize the faithfulness of other paths which may also lead people to an experience of God. We stand in God's grace, and we live that grace in our attitudes and actions toward one another. We understand the church as a community of people who get together make up the body of Christ as we strive to serve the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. We are inclusive as Christ was, welcome all people seeking a closer relationship with God. We believe that the questions are as important as the answers, that living the mystery is a more sacred position than church tradition and doctrine, and we strive to love all, serve all, in Jesus' name, as we proclaim our mystery of faith that Christ died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. You may be seated, and we'll continue in song. <laughs> Do what? It's in the bulletin, and this, are we backwards? Okay, how about, it's all right. I'm on migraine meds, so I may not be totally here, all right? <laughs> We're going to start over. Please be seated, and will the children please come forward for this morning's children's time. <laughs> Y'all want to come over here? Come over here a little bit closer so we, I can see you and you can see me. Come on up, babe. You want to sit by me or you want to sit up here in front? You sit where you want. She's like, I'm going as far over here as I can. 
Totally okay with that. Totally okay with that. So I want to ask you a question, all right? Can I ask you a question? Who loves you more than anyone in the entire world? Who loves you? Jesus. Jesus, God. Who else loves you more than anyone? Baby Jesus. Baby Jesus loves you more. That's right. Who else loves you more than? Your whole family loves you more than anyone else in the world? Anybody else love you? Huh? Your parents love you more than you? Do they love you more than Jack and Ellie? No. Okay. All right. I was just checking because my parents actually love me more than my two sisters. I always call. I say, hey, it's your favorite daughter. And they say, hi, how are you, Kim? Kim. That's my sister. They just get it mixed up all the time. But I'm their favorite. Are you your parents' favorite? No. No. Your sister is. Your sister I, is. I do bad stuff. All right, so they, they, you figured that out in your life, all right? Do you guys, do you, so let's talk about who loves us. So we've got our parents who love us. We've got God who loves us. Uh, we have each other, aunts and uncles. So do you love your, your brothers and sisters? Is that hard? Is it hard sometimes to love your brother and sister? No, yeah? it is hard not to fight with them. Okay, you love them, but you still fight with them. That's what's hard to stop, all right? How about you? Is that true for you too? Yeah, it's you love your sister, but sometimes it's hard not it's hard to get along, right? I also have a thirteen-year-old, and you have a, a teenage uh, sibling as well, right? Yeah, is that fun having a teenager in the house? No. All right, that was a, that was a hard no, people. That was a hard no. I'm just saying, right? So people love us, and what does it do for us if they love us? What do they do? Do they care for us? Yes. Yeah, do they uh, feed us and clothe yes. us and give us something to do? Do they teach us lessons? Yes. Yeah, do they make you mad? Yes. Yes, yes. yeah. Sometimes even the people we love can make us mad. And one of the things we have to keep on doing is thinking about forgiveness. Forgiveness sometimes is hard, right? It's so it's hard to not cry over yeah. someone Yeah. Oh, sometimes when you're just really upset and you cry, you want, you, you're want you just frustrated, right? Yeah, that makes sense. We all have that. All right, so here's my question again. So you've got people who love you. Listen, we've got people who love us, right? And we've got people who we know are going to take care of us and forgive us. So what can we do back to those people who love us? What can we do? Like our parents, hug them and love them too. What, love them. What can we do for God and for Jesus? That was the first forgive people you them. said love us, right? Forgive them, yeah. I don't know. Sometimes we, we forgive God because we get a little frustrated with God, but I don't know that God's doing something wrong. Can we love others for God? Yes. Yeah? Can we forgive others for God? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes when something happens, we have to forgive others, and we have to figure out for ourselves, and we have to ask God to help forgive us, right? So one of the things that I want you guys to think about this week is if somebody uh, does something and you get kind of uh, frustrated, if you had something happen... Uh, and uh, you're kind of frustrated with your sister or whatever, I want you to work on forgiving this week, all right? I want you to work on forgiving, just saying, you know, I know you didn't mean that, or you might have meant that, but I forgive you anyway. Can we try to do that this week to just let go of some of the stuff that keeps us from loving each other, all right? Can we pray together? Holy God, thank you for the ways that you are with us, the ways that you love us. We thank you for these young followers, these young kids up here this morning. May they know your love, your grace, your forgiveness, and your peace. Amen. All right, you guys head out for Sunday school. Have a good time. Are we singing a song now? Yes, yes, yes. We are singing a song now. Is this a sit or sit? Forgiven, for you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven.
to come forward at this time who have uh, declared that they want to become members of the church. Uh, the Federicos and the Bolomos, if y'all would come on up. Uh, these folks have been coming as a part of our church for a while. Uh, jo uh, Joby, the littlest uh, of the Federicos, is someone that we have prayed for quite a bit. For those of you who were here last week, you saw Joby and Grace cooing to each other and talking to each other in the back uh, of the sanctuary, which was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Uh, and I had the pleasure of baptizing this child last year, uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a delight to have them come forward today uh, to join our church. So if y'all would just stand right here, I've got a few questions for you. Now, come on, Joby, you gonna come see me, girl? <laughs> you wanna come see me? Yes, that's my girl. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So this is Joby's dad. That will be forever how you're known, right? <laughs> Joby's dad, Chris, uh, mom, uh, Gina, and grandfather, Mark. And uh, the Malomos have been a part of this church through our preschool for goodness knows, uh, 27 years. Yeah, uh, he's done work around the building. These folks are known to us, and uh, Joby is my little girlfriend. Yeah, she's my little girlfriend. So they come today to profess their faith and to become members of this congregation. So I have a few questions for you, and you answer, I do, all right? Do you believe in Jesus Christ as God's Son and our Savior who can save us from our sins and lead us to live our best lives? If you do, please say, I do. Do you intend to be a part of this congregation, to live out your faith, to teach and uh, nourish this little one and each other so that you may grow in your faith? If you do, will you say, I do? Will you be faithful in the ways that you attend and support through their tithes, your offerings, through your gifts, your graces, and your talents, your very presence, so that we may build up the community that she's a part of? If you will, say, I will. Amen. Would you welcome our new members to, uh, to Glory Day Church? <laughs> yeah. And she is our, one of our newer baptized members, so welcome. We're so glad to have you guys. Chris, love you, buddy. Love Gina. You. Oh, hey, Mark. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. I have to pass you off. Is that all right? All right. I'll 
I'll give her back. It's hard, but I'll give her back. Thank y'all, welcome, welcome so much. It is always nice. It is always nice to have new members, to have new families, but it also is nice to have all of these folks who are sitting here who are back with us. Guess what, people? Roland Schrader is sitting in his regular seat. Roland, we've been praying for you. Donna, we've been praying for you. We've been holding you as much as we can in our hands and in our hearts uh, so that you would know that you are, uh, it's just delightful to have you here. Yeah, glad you're back with us. Um, for those of you who have not been here, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount the last couple of weeks. The Sermon on the Mount is uh, uh, three sections, and we do that in three different weeks through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I don't remember if I've said this yet, but of the three sections, uh, the last one is the one I dislike the most. So here's the one we're at today, my least favorite. On the first Sunday that we were here, we talked about the Beatitudes, right? When we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes is those blessings of folks that blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those uh, who uh, are righteous uh, for righteousness sake. It's a beautiful piece uh, in the scripture and we had a, I think a really good time talking about being blessed and being a blessing to others. Last week we talked about being salt in the world, being salt and light. And this week we get to the section of the Sermon on the Mount that's called the um, Antithesis. And it's got these sections, there's four teachings. Uh, one of them is about anger, one is about adultery, the next one is about divorce, and the last one is about swearing oaths. And it's basically Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount in that moment saying, hey, the old law, the law of the Old Testament, it's still valid. And here's what happens if we don't live into that. So I want you to imagine a moment, right? So you are up on a hillside in ancient Judea, you have heard that there's a guy who's going to come teach today. You've come out, maybe with food, maybe with not. Depends on which story we get the Sermon on the Mount to, right? And uh, Jesus stands there and he begins to teach, to preach. And it takes him a long time. He's doing these things and he's explaining things. And there's no one there who's writing down everything he said. But there are people who are remembering and telling that story on forward. And it gets, uh, it gets written down and codified and comes into the scripture eventually. When you hear that first part of the story, you guys, I'm sure, felt sort of as I do when I read the Beatitudes, that Jesus is lifting us up. Jesus is saying, you're blessed. You're blessed that even though things are not great right now, you are blessed and I love you. We get that time about salt and light, and we understand that, that Jesus is encouraging us, encouraging us not to lose our saltiness, encouraging us to be a light and not hide that light. But this, fourth, this third section with its four subsections... I'm going to tell you, you're sitting here on the hill, your bum's starting to get a little tired, all right? You're not exactly sure what he's saying, possibly, or you're completely glued. Let's see. Chapter 5, verse 21 through 37. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister or sibling, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your sibling has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge. And the judge then will hand you over to the guard. And then you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Keeping you hooked yet? You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at, the woman, at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. 
And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. There's one more. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, bless the reading and the hearing of this, your holy word, but especially bless its doing. Amen. You may have heard that last prayer was just a little bit different, right? It was a question. These texts, this last part of the Sermon on the Mount, it's hard stuff. And it is stuff that is culturally embedded there. And so that was their understanding of divorce. That was their understanding of adultery. That was their understanding of oaths. That was their understanding of murder. Some of those have continued into the present day. We're still expected not to murder each other. We're expected to be friendly and open and reconciled with one another. We are expected when there is difficulty to find a way past that. We are expected to love and honor one another. The edicts and the passages that are about cultural significant things in the past, divorce and adultery and oaths even, I want to lay aside for a minute because they are not teachings for this moment. They're not teachings for this culture. That is not really all that we believe, and they are so complex that there's no way to do that in an entire sermon, all right? So I want you just to hold that and know that is not where we stand. It's not where we stand as a church or as a denomination around divorce and adultery. We affirm all people in whatever relationship status they're in. So I want to clarify that first. The second piece is I want to applaud myself because I have kept the first of those really, really well. I have not killed a single person. My entire life, I have, I have kept from doing that. I have refused to do it. I have just said, nope, nope, not going to do it, not going to do it. Even my sister, a couple of times, uh, maybe an old boss, once or twice, uh, thought about it. The driver who cut me off and almost made me wreck my brand new car last week, that was a really close call, a really close call. When I read this text, when you read the, the Sermon on the Mount and these other lessons, these teachings, these prophecies that Jesus is giving us, there are these moments when Jesus is trying to clarify who we are by also clarifying who he is. And in this moment, he has said, up to this moment, he has said, I am not here to deny or to end the old ways. I am here to fulfill them right? Not here to say the Old Testament rules about not, you know, the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments of the Old Testament are no longer valid. It's to say there is more that we have to do. It's not a but that we don't have to. Do not kill, but here's this other thing you need to do. And, and it takes the place of do not kill. We're still not supposed to kill. But we're also supposed to reconcile ourselves together. I was uh, serving uh, Hasbrook Heights United Methodist Church when I was going to graduate school in New Jersey. And I was there, it was a fairly small congregation, about 120 members. Uh, we had sometimes as many as 60 or 70 in church, and uh, on big high holy days we'd have about 100, and uh, it felt like everyone on the rolls was there. There was this really powerful prayer witness, prayer ministry that was a part of that congregation. Uh, and the person who ran it was a woman named Wilma. And Wilma, I'm telling you, had a more spiritual and prayerful life than anyone I've ever known. It was always right there on the edge of her, right? And so it didn't matter what was going on. You knew any given second if she heard a news story, if she heard somebody who was in pain, if she heard a siren far away, she would immediately go into this like pose and this meditative prayer time. And I knew that Wilma was someone that I always wanted to make sure that I stayed on the right side of. I wanted her praying for me, right? I always wanted her praying for me. And there were a number of people that throughout the life of the church would tell Wilma, I need a prayer uh, made. There were people who would not do that, and Wilma would hear about it from others. Uh, and we were pretty good, like this congregation, on Sundays to share our joys and our concerns together. And so Wilma would continue with her ministry. 
Well, we had another woman in the church, a woman in the church who was like, she was the chair of the women's club. Uh, she had all these different roles, both official and unofficial in the church. And she sort of started slowing down. She wasn't doing as much anymore. She was in her early 80s. Her husband had passed away about five years before that. And she just really didn't seem to have a whole lot of energy. Uh, but she kept on trying to do all the stuff she possibly could. Her name was Elsie. And Elsie uh, came to me uh, when she was beginning to sort of decline, and I saw some things going on in her life, and she said, I want you to know something, but I want to keep it in confidence. And I said, all right, what's going on? And she said, I have stage 4 pancreatic cancer, and I want to live the rest of my life with nobody knowing. I've told my kids, but I want to just be me and I will slip when I get far enough away, and I will go somewhere to die. I know this community. I know they're going to try to fix me, and I'm done. It was her fourth battle with cancer. We could all see that Elsie was struggling. We could see her body begin to sort of change as the disease took more and more over of her. And... uh, Wilma came to me and she said, I know something's going on with Elsie. I need you to find out what it is because I think she's sick and I need to pray for her. And I said, well, you need to to know that everyone has a right to privacy and if she doesn't want to share that, she's not going to. Uh, And Wilma said, then you know something. And I said, "I, I cannot confirm or deny that I know anything, which is, of course, they say, well, you just confirmed it because you won't deny it, right? So I'm sitting there, and I, I'm trying to weigh back and forth, and I said, can you just pray for her anyway, right? And Wilma looks at me, and she says, Elsie and I have been friends for 47 years. The fact that she won't tell me tells me everything I need to know. She's done with me, and I'm done with her. It was a powerful moment. And as I stood there, I thought, Seriously? Because she won't tell you something that's going on in her life that you don't know for sure is happening. You're severing your relationship, and I thought, she'll get over it. She's a little ticked off today. She'll take care of it. She'll get it all fixed. Elsie lasted seven weeks. She had really advanced pancreatic cancer. In the last three weeks, we didn't see her at all. I went up to the hospital. A couple of people in the neighborhood began to get inklings from her daughters uh, what was going on. And at the funeral, uh, the family was sitting on this side of the sanctuary, and sort of our women's group, the women's club, and all of the folks that that she had been dealing with, been working with all these years, were sitting over here. And I noticed that Wilma was sitting in the back and not up here. So we're gathering. We're getting all the stuff gathered together for the service. And I went back to her, and I said, do you want to come up and sit up front with the rest of the women's group? I wasn't sure if you knew that they were up there. And she said, nope, no desire. I'm here against my will. And so what happened? And she said, my husband said, if you don't go to this funeral, you'll never forgive yourself, and neither will I. Get your butt to the funeral. Well, you know what happened. She didn't. She didn't come up and wish her good friend goodbye. She did not do anything. She festered in her anger for days and days and weeks and months. That was 17 years ago when I was in that church, and that's what happened I saw her about five years ago. I saw Wilma at a a United Methodist Conference event that I had to go to for the seminary, and I asked her how she was, and she said, I'm still angry. It was the first words out of her mouth, I'm still angry. And I didn't know what to do. I mean, how do you, how do you, what do you do? How, How do you force two people to reconcile together, right? I mean, this text, Jesus is saying, don't kill each other. But here's the other thing. I want you not to be angry with each other. If, if you get angry with somebody, I want you to fix it. If you want to, to pray, go fix that relationship before you come to church to pray because you're not prayerfully engaging with God if you're still angry and frustrated with others. Now, let's also put a caveat here. Not every relationship can we reconcile. There are some relationships we don't need to be a part of. There are some situations that we need to exit out of. But what God is saying through the power of Jesus in the the Sermon on the Mount is there are moments when we get short with each other. We get frustrated with each other. We have sibling rivalries. We have uh, relationships that fall apart. We have people that don't tell us things that we wish we knew. All of these things can happen, and we can get very frustrated and angry. The issue is to try to fix that, to find a way forward. After this conference, I sent 
a note to Wilma. I, she still lived in the same house. I wrote out the note, and I said, listen, if you could have a moment that you think about your friendship, write out a note, mail it to some unknown address. I forgive you. You don't know who I am. I'm forgiving someone else. I'm just sending this. If it gets to somebody, that's fine. Do that. Write a letter and burn it. Put a little pink uh, flower and vase and stuff together because Elsie's favorite color was pink and have a little moment of prayer and solitude. Uh, and she wrote back and said, I didn't ask for your help and I don't need it. And I thought, all right, I'm done. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I was done. I was like, if you can't reconcile yourself to one of your best friends for 47 years, there's nothing I can do, right? And I started thinking about what was going on with Elsie, though. You see? She was ill. She didn't want anyone to know. But then I started trying to think about what was going on with Wilma, that she could not find it in her heart to reconcile. And I think that's one of the things that gets in our way. It gets in our way of truly being the disciples we're called to be because we don't reconcile with ourselves. We don't get ourselves in a place where we can say, I'm going to move forward. We don't reconcile with the frustrations and the failures and all of the, the problems that are happening. Cindy and I accidentally ran into a show on, uh, from, a B, from BBC uh, that's on TV right now. It's called the, the Sky News uh, Landscape Artist of the Year. I, I used to paint. I, I want to get back into it, but I loved painting. Painting was one of the things I always did and wanted to do. And it's these landscapers who come into these contests. There's like six in each, uh, in each uh, uh, level, and they move through. And they, there was fabric artists and oil painters and uh, acrylics and watercolor and uh, ink and drawing and all kinds of stuff. And there was this one character, this one woman who was a contestant on the show, and her name was Jen Gash. And the first episode that she was in, there was this woman who sort of was, you know, kind of small. She sort of smalled herself, right? She sort of would just sort of collapse in on herself. She didn't raise her head a whole lot. Uh, she didn't speak very boldly. Uh, and I just sort of felt drawn to her. I was like, there's something going on with her. It's interesting that she's in this contest, right? And she begins to paint, and I think it was a, a water scene or something. Maybe it was a cathedral. Uh, and they're painting, and I mean, several times she goes back and you know paint, paints over something she doesn't like, or she washes something off, or she changes, and she walks away, and she's like, "This is awful. I can't stand this. No one's going to love this." And it was just all this demeaning kind of stuff to herself. And um, I was really surprised, but she won her heat. It wasn't my favorite painting, but I thought that's kind of cool. So uh, the next level she was in, she won that contest. And again, not a painting I really loved, but it was pretty good. And then that, uh, that third episode that she's on, which is the semifinals, they do some interviews of the final contestants of these uh, semifinalists. And she starts talking about what's happened over the last two years in her life. Her daughter, who was a high school student, had gone through a significant depression, and they had to take her out of school, and Jen gave up her studio. She was a professional uh, painter. She gave up her studio to take care of her daughter. Her daughter was really struggling. And for those two years, she didn't paint but a couple of times. She lost connection to who she was while she was trying to be there for her daughter. She began during that two-year period to discover that she thought, you know, I had depression growing up too. I think I gave that to my daughter. I need to reconcile that I have caused this. And her daughter kept saying, no, you didn't cause it. It's something that happens. In the final, when Jen Gash was one of the final three, they interviewed her even more. And as she walked onto the set, she had her head up high. Her shoulders were back. She was talking about her art with confidence and conviction. Her daughter, who had not been at any of the other episodes, was there sitting there watching, proud of her mom, loving every minute of being out and in the world and encouraging her mother to be her best self. She won. And every single painting she did, she erased part of it in because she hated it. She didn't love it. She didn't think it was good enough. And almost every single time she said there was this moment where she was connected with her daughter, and her daughter would say, no, Mom, that's not nothing. That's not bad. That's great. Keep going. The reconciliation that had happened over those two years not only reconciled mother and daughter who had drifted and depression had flourished, but what she also reconciled was her own gifts and her own graces with herself and with God. 
And it was a powerful moment of sort of, you know, somebody blooming right there on the screen over a six-week series of TV shows. And if you've not watched the show and I just ruined it for you, I apologize. There are other seasons, all right? Um, and when they, when they went to uh, unveil the 10,000-pound commission that she did for the Imperial Naval uh, Observatory in, in London, she walked up with absolute confidence and pulled down a draped painting that was the most beautiful painting she had done the entire season. And I just sat in my chair last night, and, and I started weeping, and I was like, all right, your sermon's changing. And I started thinking about the times when I have been unable to reconcile with somebody else. It often is not them, it's me. I remember about this lessons not only of Elsie and Wilma, but other stories that you know and I know where reconciliation never took place. And part of it's on them, but part of it's on us. When we have communion and we come to the table, we're saying to everyone, I love you and I forgive you for all that you have done. Please love me and forgive me what, for what I have done. We do it with our kids, we do it with our spouses, we do it with our parents, but we don't always do it fully. Reconciliation in a time where there is a lot of animosity and conflict can be really testy. It can be very scary, it can be very fearful to go to a sibling and say, I know we don't get along very well, can we talk about what separates us? To go to a parent that you don't talk to anymore, to go to a kid that you're frustrated with and angry at. We have to let go of some of the stuff that is holding us back before we can walk through. That's what it felt like when Jen Gash let go of all of that stuff that was holding her back. She had, this, she had this hunched nature in the beginning. And then as she began to blossom and bloom, her arms began to unfold and she walked into a world much more open and wide and loving and able to be there and love others. Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount's hard. But the basic lesson is this. In the first set, you're going to be blessed if you do the things that I call you to do. In the second set, be salt and light. Let others feel the flame of your love and the seasoning that you bring with you. And in the third set, reconcile. Be reconciled one to the other. Be reconciled yourself to your very being, your soul, your heart, your mind. And be reconciled to God. It is only through that that we can live fully into who God calls us to be. Let's try that. Amen. We come to that time when we share our joys and our concerns together. I want to lift up a couple that uh, I'm aware of. Uh, we did the, uh, the funeral services yesterday for Brian Reed's uh, uh, big brother. Uh, Brian, at age 13, uh, received a big brother. His name was Richard Mull, uh, and he changed Brian's life. Uh, eventually adopted Brian as an adult, uh, and all of the Reed uh, and Mall and Pickerskill uh, family, that are the, the people who he, uh, that uh, he ad adopted, sorry, uh, were here yesterday. It was a beautiful service, uh, and so I would ask you to lead, uh, to keep Brian and Stacy Reed, uh, the Mall family and the Pickerskill uh, family, in your prayers. Again. Roland, good to have you back. Good to see you here. Uh, we continue to pray for baby Owen, who is uh, uh, having some other treatments to see whether or not his heart is growing enough and, and is keeping track enough that they don't have to do heart surgery, but that's still an option. Uh, Ed Brucker, who was in the hospital a little bit this week, he's home now. Uh, Chris Hearn, whose mother's funeral was this weekend, please keep her in your prayers. Uh, and all of those with uh, cancer and dealing with other uh, illnesses and diseases. And prayers of rejoicing and welcome to our new members uh, in the back. We're so glad to have you here. Are there other joys and concerns that you would like to lift up today? Yeah, Laura. For Bobby, okay. Our newly engaged Chelsea. Yes, y'all can applaud for that, yeah. Oh, she's not in here. <laughs> she's in with y'all's you. She's singing later. Thank you, I was like... We lost her. What happened? Anyway, uh, well, uh, congratulations to Chelsea. Uh, other joys and concerns that you have today? Yes. My daughter fell yesterday on a snow skiing trip and broke her shoulder. Broke her shoulder. What's her name? Veronica. Veronica was on a snow 
uh, trip yesterday and into snow tubing and broke her shoulder. Wow, I've heard that's very, very painful. We will keep her in our prayers for sure. Others, yeah. All right, a mother who needs to get a procedure who has the claustrophobia and the testing they need to do, I think can really do a number on that. We'll pray for you and for those folks who are working with her to find a way for that to happen. Other joys and concerns today? Yes. Successful surgery for your daughter. All right, yes. Then let's go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we know that you're already present in the situations that we name this day. We know that you're already there. You're there helping them recover. You're there helping welcome them. You are there loving them. May we too reach out and love these folks in the way that they need to be loved. God, sometimes reconciliation doesn't happen. Sometimes it happens almost too late. Sometimes it happens in our own time, and sometimes it's forced on us. God, be with us as we continue to struggle to be who you call us to be, but know in our hearts that you're leading us towards reconciliation, love, grace, forgiveness, and hope. Holy God, there are many places around our planet, places around our country, places around our community, places within our own families, where your presence is so richly and deeply needed. Guide us and direct us so that we may reconcile with others, reconcile with ourselves so that we may reconcile with you. Making things right is not always easy, but the attempt, the work to make things right is. It's important. Holy God, we thank you for this community of faith. We thank you for all of the kids who are part of our community for the teens and tweens and youth. We thank you for our families, for our oldies but goodies, as Betsy calls them. We thank you for everyone sitting in our worship service here or around the world, wherever they might be, on their computers or laptops. God, we ask you to bless this community. Bless us as we reconcile one to the other to live into who you call us to be. It was through your son, Jesus Christ, that we learned to reconcile. It is through the power of his love, grace, and forgiveness that we can do that at all. As we pray the prayer that he taught us, may we feel that power, that encouragement, that grace, forgiveness, and love as we say the words he taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite the ushers to please come forward for this morning's offering.
news i've got four pans i need some chili uh for this week for tuesday night's community meal uh we uh, uh have a wonderful time sharing and being a part of this community of faith uh on tuesday nights is anyone i got i got one more pan is there anyone who could do one more pan thank you very much thank you very much we just need them by tuesday at four o'clock if you can do that uh we appreciate it if you'll turn to the back of your bulletins i want to let you know about a couple of things that are going on uh, there's a few things that are coming up very quickly that we want you to know about. Uh, on uh, this week, we will finish the five-week series that we've been doing uh, for our Growing in Grace series uh, on uh, science and faith. Uh, and this one is going to be about the rise of technology in our faith. Uh, and we're going to see how technology is even in the biblical text, all right? Uh, but maybe not the way some people think it is. Ah, we'll see. Uh, then we're going to take a week off, and then we're going to do our... our uh, Lenten series is going to be a six-week series on the geography of Jesus' ministry. So we're going to take Jesus' ministry and some of the things that were really pivotal to his, uh, to his life, the Sea of Galilee, the mountains, Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, uh, the Jordan River, and we're going to look at the geography and the stories and some of the things, the history. Uh, I think it's going to be really fun, and uh, so that'll start uh, the week after uh, that. We're, so we're going to do this week, finish up Science and Faith. Next week we're off, and then we'll start back March 3rd. Lunch and Learn on Friday is for caregivers. 
uh, and those who have caregivers in their life. Uh, there's an uh, expert coming to do a, a conference then. It's going to be, a, I think, a wonderful opportunity for us to talk through uh, and for folks to, to hear some supportive ways that they can uh, receive care as caregivers themselves. Uh, the tech team is still looking for someone to help with 11 and 11. One, uh, uh, one house at a time. Our Beds for Kids is happening on Saturday. Um, we have Ash Wednesday coming up uh, next week on the 26th. We'll have sh uh, service. Both of them are in the chapel, one at noon and one at 7 next Wednesday for Ash Wednesday to sort of help us get into the Lenten spirit and into the Lenten uh, time period. A couple of things coming up that you can sign up for are Queen Esther event, St. Francis Inn Soup Kitchen, uh, and also ice skating. And Eric, I'm going to call on you just for a second, even though I didn't get you ahead of time. Would you come up for just a second? Um, one of the things that this church has to do every once in a while is we have to recruit folks to help with some stuff. Uh, and I think this ought to be a no-brainer to be able to get folks to come to five or six, maybe seven meetings a year and give away money. Uh, I think that's not a bad deal, right? Uh, so we're looking for endowment board media, uh, members, and I'm going to ask if you're okay, since I've already brought you up here. <laughs> would you tell us just a little bit about what sure. you guys do? Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I'm Eric Hanneman. Um, I'm here representing uh, our endowment board. And uh, I think one of the things we've done over the last few years that I've been a part of it is um, really been able to grow the uh, fund, thanks in large part to the assistance of Rick Graber and Thriving. And, um, but one of the problems we had is trying to continue to refill our membership. So folks' terms were, uh, expire after three or six years, depending on how long they can stay. And so we've kind of needed more people to kind of join the board. Um, we've done a few things over the last year to kind of reduce the number of folks that need to be on the board, but um, we would like to see if anyone is in it really interested. We meet once a month, um, primarily during the school year. We take off for the summer, and uh, the things we do is essentially manage the fund, uh, receive requests from the congregation and the community, and, and review them and see if we can help distribute some of those funds. And the big thing we do each year is um, put out the, um, the Gelt Scholarship and award that in June. Um, last year, we were able to award $18,000 worth of different distributions. Uh, yeah, well, thank, thank you. Um, 12000 of that was towards scholarships, and an additional 6000 was supporting many of the many missions that individuals within the community are doing, as well as the church mission trip. And uh, we're on, more on pace to do the same thing this year. Um, but we really do need uh, a larger diversity of opinions of points of view, of ideas, um, because the smaller the group is, the less of all that you really have. So the email, my email address is in the uh, bulletin. Just please reach out to me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions offline. Thank yep. you. All right, and one of the things that I, thank you very much, thank you. One of the things I want to stress is that uh, you're, you're getting advice from uh, folks, and then you're going to make some decisions, but you do not have to have experience working in an endowment board. Uh, you do not have to have investment experience. You just want to come uh, as someone who loves the church and the world and wants to give some money away. I mean, who doesn't want that? Uh, so we would love to fill that up with a couple of more people. Uh, as he said, it's not a huge commitment of time throughout the year, but uh, uh, we'd enjoy you doing that. And the last thing I need to ask you is please, please, please do not bring us your flea market stuff until May, like late May. We want all of your stuff to go in the flea market that happens the first Saturday in May, but we're out of space. And it is going into other places. So I know you want to get rid of it. Could you hang on to it for a couple more months? All right, just a couple more months. Find a little corner. Put a you know drape a, a you know a blanket over it. Just pretend like it's a modern art. I don't care. Uh, but we really don't have space for it. We will begin to clear out as we get closer uh, and get ready for that. But we still want you to support that. It's a part of our mission support uh, activities, and so we'll hope you do that. Are there any other announcements that you have this morning? Anything? All right, well, let's stand for our final song. Giving you glory, honor, blessing, and praise. Together we'll, we'll pass it on, bring us up your way. Every generation, they will tell their children.
go this week and pass on grace and hope and peace and love to others and reconcile where we need to do that with ourselves, with our siblings, our neighbors, our friends, and with God. Go in peace. Amen.